So here we go. So today we're gonna do Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And what I wanna show you is that this, the Catholic view is based on Aristotle's science and then that's applied to public affairs, okay? And that's really important because Black Lives Matter still runs on that overall worldview. And the popes and the Catholic church, it's a billion people, they still have the just war theory, the um, positions on in vitrio. They have, you know, these things persist. And the, what the Pope said in front of the UN, that's legit, that's, that's important. But then when you make that transition to Descartes, then you've got modern mathematical dualism. So between Descartes and Kant, that was the beginning of the um, artificial intelligence. And, and we have a huge swath of people who now are trained in math uh, and computer technology. And it's and biology from the point of view of re-engineering the natural world, right? Right. You study it in order to fix change. it and change yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And so Bill Gates and about a dozen billionaires have invested in applying engineering technology to try and prevent the end of life on earth. And they, they know what's at stake. But there's also many billion dollars of engineers who are still into the fossil fuel industry and they are at war against each other, right? But what I wanna show you is the mindset behind all of that, okay? Because people on either side can literally believe in God, all right? And I think all this stuff is important because it's really hard to figure out how to avoid polarization. And the way to do that is to figure out how other people think, right? And, and it's been shocking to me to find out how a lot of other people think. It hadn't occurred to me to think these ways, but it's good for me, right? It's good because how else do I learn how to be a citizen in a country where people think in all these different ways? And how do you learn how to communicate with people and how to find some common ground? So, so and then the, the, the last day on Descartes, is how he thought, what he thought applied to how you make decisions about how to live, okay? The punchline there is that, yeah, he's a privileged, isolated, unmarried white guy, French guy sitting in his house. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, it, this is not gonna apply to very many people, uh, but it's interesting and we have a real problem with professionals who are insulated in these silos and the way they live their life is either so detached or else does not take into account other people's lives. So you can be really smart and really oblivious to the impact of your actions on other people or to have any desire to communicate with other people. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it makes sense. And from a psychological standpoint, and Warren, you'll know, and you might also know, Dr. Beck, um, have you heard of theory of mind? Vaguely, yes. Okay, that's a stage of childhood development that, I mean, in which a child actually has to develop the capacity to understand that what they do affects other people and that it's okay for other people to have different opinions, different beliefs. And it, what you just said about kind of being off in your own world, oblivious to other things, 
<laughs> it kind of reminded me of that because if you're not in a position where you have to practice those skills and, and practice being aware of what you say and do and how it affects other people, it makes it that much easier to just ignore anything other than what's right in front of you. Right. Yeah. And, and again, Aristotle has, he, out of a 10 books, his ethics has 10 books, two books is about friendships. And friendships are really important because you have to have, people need to be relating to each other in a lot of levels, always for the well-being of each other, okay? In order to have a social fabric that hangs together. All right, so let's go to Martin Luther King now first. And well, okay, so I'm gonna do one last take on the Pope at the UN just because, um, because we're talking about, you know, all sorts of issues, right? So the Pope would reject religious bigotry. Okay, remember his view of the natural world is everything drives toward its good, right? The universe is, is uh, evolves toward higher and higher levels of complexity. And uh, so the, the, the galaxies, right? The universe is always expanding. And then the biosphere runs on that same force, that same principle, higher and higher levels of complexity. And then human beings, their nature is to drive toward higher and higher levels of complexity, the idea of the good. And we're all the same that way. And we have the same capabilities and we should treat each other the same. And the belief in God, you know, he felt that there is an underlying first principle that you can understand. He also thought there is the supernatural God that intervenes. But that God is never going to intervene in a way that justifies somebody saying somebody is evil because they're Muslim or because they're not Christian, ever. Religious bigotry is completely wrong on this view of nature, human nature, and then what sort of a supernatural God, what that God would do and would not do. Does that make sense to all of you, to both of you? So yeah, it fundamentalism, that is completely wrong on this view of reality. Um, partisan bickering, do you remember that politics is natural and politicians rule for the benefit of the ruled? And that is so important that if a society gets corrupt enough, it's okay to commit sedition, right? To undermine the social order for the sake of, if you have to try to do it in a way that will get the leaders to self-correct, right? And Romero decided at a certain point he was gonna engage in nonviolent resistance. And they, it started a lot of violence, but it wasn't his fault. So you can actually um, refuse to follow the dictates of an unjust society because politics is natural and it's important and it's always for the sake of the greater good. And a, a Christian would do evil to comply with an unjust system. Does that right. make sense? I, I, yeah, I know that's based on his natural law theory, but that's also in line with what's written in the Bible. Well, except you can pick Bible quotes, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there are Bible quotes that condone bigotry. Yeah, right? uh, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah because, I know I can find them. Yeah, depending on how you, you translate it. That's true, but I mean, yeah. there are some No, yeah, I get what you're saying, yeah the Philistines, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, the Psalms really, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's just the Bible is a big book 
And I've been around students who really do nitpick, you know, cherry pick their quotes, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, right? And so that's it. Like you can use that to be a bigot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know, Alicia. It breaks your heart. <laughs> I know. I mean, uh, it was, oh my God, I never met anybody like that in my life. And I get to lie in and, you know, <laughs> yeah, you can imagine. But anyway, yeah. so that's why, that's why this is important. Like this is a billion people that he's talking to and representing. And he goes and meets with Muslim leaders and he does this stuff to send these signals. Um, and they're, they are definitely fun. They're not outside of the worldview at all. They're definitely fundamental to the worldview. Stop punishing immigrants because the Old Testament especially is all about hospitality. You know, I mean, Abraham, it, I mean, hospitality was huge in that time because people were, the, there weren't any hotels, you know, <laughs> there was an inn, right? I mean, but it was very important when people traveled that uh, people gave them hospitality. Um, foreign, okay, might makes right. Obviously that that's wrong. That's wrong on a rational view and it's wrong on a religious view and you cannot use religion. Religion is being used as a weapon throughout the world. I just finished a book about that, about um, polarization in a number of different countries. And in many of them, religion is being used as a weapon. So when the Pope comes out and says this, it's really important. And other you know, major religious leaders need to come out and say exactly these kinds of things, which they will if they unite reason and faith. But if they don't, they can say anything they want. Um, anyway, stop global arms trade. Obviously, that would not fit with any religious tradition. Greed is a major problem in every religious tradition. Um, the death penalty is, yeah, I mean, it's not consistent. If you can always convert, you shouldn't kill someone when they still are capable of converting. Um, Creating good jobs, rule for the sake of the rule, the importance of a stable middle class, stop ignoring climate change, destroying the earth, right? So these are huge, huge international issues. Okay, so my thing on Martin Luther King is that he also adopted that same, his letter has Augustine, Aquinas, uh, which would include Aristotle, it has Socrates in it. He's very well versed in this tradition. Um, and also he understands the founding fathers. He understands, he, he studied as a PhD, you know? Um, but so I'm gonna whip through this. The Bible has been used to justify slavery, but the prophets spoke out against injustices and against corruption and complacency and greed. Moses spoke out, um, he resisted the Pharaoh, right? Nonviolent civil disobedience. Amos spoke, spoke out. Um, I, that sermon of Amos is so brilliant. He starts out condemning all their enemies, you know, for three generations and four, the Assyrians have done blah, blah, and everybody's, yeah. and then he goes, you. <laughs> you have you know done this i mean it's brilliant because it just shows we love to project our crap on other people but then to turn turn the light on yourself so it's it's a brilliant sermon um then there's the notion of continuing revelation that we have these minds again that goes back to reason that god gave us reason and so we can use our reason and our faith to continually um, understand what we're supposed to do in the world that we live in, right? Um, Jesus violated the religious laws. He, he, you know, he's against legalism. Um, spirit of the law and the letter of the law. Segregationist laws go against the spirit and the letter 
of God's laws and of American laws, right? Um, let's see, Romans, the Roman law. Um, there was a lot of irony there, and, and some of you know that better than I do. But when Jesus said, uh, render to Caesar, what's C to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what's God's, it seems like he said, you know, don't try to politicize what I'm saying. Don't try to make it into a political movement. It's a spiritual movement. Um, Nonviolent resistance, okay? Jesus criticized the Pharisee. Paul criticized the Romans and got in trouble. Uh, the early Christians got persecuted. Gandhi um, and Martin Luther King imitated Gandhi quite a bit. Um, Socrates questioned the rulers of Athens, knew he was getting into trouble, but he did respect the rule of law. He just engaged in nonviolent uh, resistance. Um, Euthyphro, blah, blah. Aristotle and segregationist laws, right? Aristotle was used to justify slavery. It was not legit. Aristotle said, there are slaves by nature, which would mean like someone with an IQ of 80 who, who should probably live in a, in a, what they have those houses for people with low IQs where they give them as much freedom as they can, but to try and throw them on the street and have them fend for themselves just doesn't work. But he says, Aristotle, most slaves are slaves by conquest. And all of the slaves in the US were slaves by conquest. But it was still used to justify it, right? Um, justice is receiving a just uh, remuneration, salary, benefits from your work, distribution of goods, the way uh, crimes are punished, applying the laws, right? All of that was Aristotle. Martin Luther King's uh, movement is pointing out that if you're black, you don't receive a decent job, a decent pay, decent uh, education or healthcare. You get uh, unfair treatment in the courts um, and the applications of the laws are unfair. The juries are wrong, the judges are corrupt. Um, the Stoics also had this belief in universal laws. Uh, but they engaged in nonviolent resistance when the ruler was unjust. Augustine, we've studied that, right? Eternal law, temporal law. We have this innate idea. Then we have St. Thomas. He made it more naturally, tied it to Aristotle. Um, and um, Martin Luther King, it's harder to deal with liberals because um, we could get sympathy against the segregationists, but the liberals, um, they kept saying, oh, it's too, you're trying to go too fast. He said, it's 400 years. Like, how long do I have to wait? So the liberals are just saying, I don't want to be uncomfortable, right? I don't want to have to pay a price. I want to have the right opinions, but I don't want to have a price. Um, okay, the old law and the new law, um, the old law was just legalism and the new law is love your neighbor. Okay, so here's letter from a Birmingham jail. The point was to prove that his actions were the right actions to take. He was taking them for the right reason and acting in the right way, right? That whole letter is very much in that Aristotelian background of you have to explain what you're doing, that you tried all the other possibilities. And it's brilliant in that way. It follows the just war theory. It follows all those criteria because he was educated that way. He was acting according to natural law. Why did he take it? Well, they tried to negotiate, right? They were promised things and they broke the promise. Um, and direct action causes tension, but it isn't Martin Luther King's fault. He got blamed. He said, you're causing violence. He's not causing the violence. He's acting in a way that's just and, and people are reacting violently, but that's not his fault, right? Um, people never change without tension. He's trying to create the kind of tension 
that would promote positive change. Um, why didn't I wait? Because without direct action, the new mayor wouldn't change anything. So he's very specific to the situation, right? He has political pressures and motives to preserve the status quo. So it's important to act before he gets into office. And so that he, while he's running for office, right? While he's preparing, he, he gets a message that you need to change. Um, wealthy people benefit from the status quo, from the oppression. Why can't you wait? Well, we've already been waiting, like that, forget it, right? Um, why should we, yeah? I don't remember what I was reading, but as I was reading the letter from Birmingham jail and this part about waiting, it reminded me of, I, I mean, I had just read it. It might've been for our other class, but to, to delay any more would have been to, like to, to deny the problem. Right. Like you could, yeah, like if you just kept waiting, it was like you had just admitted defeat. Right, to yeah. be complicit. And he did yeah. talk about African-Americans that had given in. Yeah, right? so that might be what, what it's from. Yeah, there were the people who just uh, gave up. There were the people who got the middle-class jobs and then put up and shut up and didn't help. And then there were the people who just flat out resisted and they created violence. Like it wasn't his fault that there was violence. Um, uh, let's see, the psychological, there's, I mean, we're demonstrating against a specific issue, but underneath that is a huge psychological, social, political, economic, and intellectual system of oppression, right? Of humiliation. Do you remember when his daughter wanted to go to Fun Town because it was advertised on TV and he had to tell her she couldn't go? And he, he said, I could see this dark cloud, right? That must have broken his heart. Yeah. I mean, that's awful. Um, all right, so, but your actions precipitate violence. Isn't that awful? That happened in Black Lives Matter too. It was 93% peaceful. And there were police officers, um, off-duty police officers that were inciting violence, right? Because they wanted it to fail. And I mean, I knew that it was the same stuff it had before. I've lived long enough. Um, all right, so on the golden mean, nonviolent resistance is between two extremes to either do nothing and allow injustice to happen or to just get out an AK-47 and start shooting, right? Um, so this is the best way. Um, he knows that the segregationists are wrong and he knows it can turn into violence. He's trying to prevent that. Uh, but for the white liberals to just tell him you're going too fast, that makes it really hard. That was really annoying. He needed their support. Um, he's disappointed in the church because the church has become nothing but a social club rather than a place where people can actually grow. Um, and that's important, I think, People are more segregated in churches now by race and class and ethnicity than, than they are at work, okay? Because churches have become social clubs. Um, we were blind to the injustice of slavery, right? And there's a whole lot of stuff out now. Mm -hmm. So what reactions did you get? So what did you think, Alicia? Um, the first time, I guess a couple of years ago, probably, yeah, I think it was in your class in 2019 that I read this letter. I didn't, my attention wasn't drawn to uh, causing attention in the mind, you know, when he referred to Socrates and that that was what he was trying to do with his nonviolent demonstration was to cause this tension that 
has to be addressed. Okay. And so that, and then I liked um, where That's he here, said, I actually quoted that, right? Yeah, yeah. And then when he said that, oh, I don't think I'm gonna be able to, to quote it word for word. Nobody that lives inside the United States can be considered an other or an outsider as long as they're within the United States. Okay, yeah. And that, um, that reminded me of, oh, it might have been the Pope's address. Okay. Saying yeah. that, saying that, well, I guess about the, the bigotry. And Maybe. also immigrants, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and well, one, one other thing is, you know, he was speaking to fellow clergymen. You know, he didn't defend his actions against other people, or he didn't defend himself to other people. He, he took the criticism and he did what he needed to do. But when his fellow clergymen, who should have been willing to look at the issue and support what was happening, were telling him that he was wrong. You know, and so I think it takes a lot of fortitude to, to, I don't know, to talk to somebody that you know and say, I'm not wrong. You're wrong for not supporting me. Right. I, I just. Right. Yeah. It was, the, it was the liberals, yeah. the liberal um, Christian that really. That were telling him they should just keep laying down and taking it. Right. Because. Yeah because those liberals wanted to believe they were good, yeah. but they didn't want to do anything. And um, yeah, well, actually my, that's, my dad went and marched with him, you know, in Selma, um, because he was, you know, he understood that. Yeah. And um, my church, I go to a Methodist church right now, and we're this month during Black History Month, we're reading a book by, um, Oh my gosh, what's it called again? I just read the whole book. But anyway, the whole church is reading this book about um, racism. There's three versions for kids, a kind of um, another short version then a really long 700 page, but it, it is amazing how I, didn't, I did not know those facts about American history and this whole thread of racism. I mean, I knew some things, but wow, there's so much. I'm glad that now we're getting these books out that yeah. really give you a lot better picture. And of course, we've had this huge reaction against it, right? Lots of politicians. The next election, of major issues are going to be making my kid read critical race theory, right, in school. And that's because they don't want them to look at the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. They don't want them to look at the stuff that's the most important stuff. So they will distract them. And you can always use racism as your, you know, card. They're playing the race card again. Well, that, that goes back to the whole thing of if you acknowledge the issue, then you have to make a change. I know. And they don't. So by bringing the issue to light, a change is, it, well, it creates that tension that he's talking about. Right. Okay? Exactly. And so that's what they're trying to avoid. They want people to remain blissfully unaware. And I don't know that the nation can remain unaware any longer, you know. Well, it is, so. it is going to be used as a huge polarizing issue. Yeah. It already is right now. And if you look at this history, you'll see that always happened. It always happened. Um, these guys know exactly how much racism there is in this country and they know they can tap into it. And the, the trouble with me is, well, Martin Luther King understood this too. We started having a poor people's march because he started realizing there's money behind here, right? Money is a big issue in what's maintaining racism. And people make money off of the status quo. 
So that's exactly what's happening right now in our country. There are people who want to stick to fossil fuels and they're giving a billion bucks to the campaigns. Fossil fuel and other backward looking uh, ways to make money, right? As opposed to Bill Gates. And they really have taken over, tried to control the political space and the political rhetoric and distract people with racism, which has happened before, right? Um, so you can't do it with sexism anymore. There was, people were winning elections by trashing feminists. Mm -hmm. But uh, now so many women have co-opted into the system and they defend it that, that, you know, you can't get any votes on that because everybody is assimilationist, right? Um, so many women have just assimilated to it. They make money, they have power, uh, but um, black people still, race is still such a huge issue. But what about you, Warren? What do you think? What did you think of the letter from a Birmingham jail? All right, so from what I took from it, I took some notes while going through, so I'm gonna be reading from the notes because good. I took a lot from it so I cannot spit it all out. That's and when good. I write it down, I process it better. So I said, um, the first thing that um, stood out to me where he said was that injustice anywhere, yeah. is justice everywhere. Um, what I said about that was in those times and still even now, the white power structure is taking over and causing many problems for everyone. And basically the injustice is, in one place is injustice everywhere. Basically it means that the people who are where he is or where he was at that point are literally the same persons in other places. So like the same black people that are where he is at, it's the same black people out in the world. And to be in Birmingham, the, um, where he said, Birmingham is the most segregated state in the country. So I think why he is there trying to do what he's doing when he says injustice is the same, injustice one place is injustice everywhere. Trying to make a change in Birmingham, which is the most segregated place might create a domino effect. So if they see that Martin, this guy is able to make a change in Birmingham, the biggest place that is segregated, maybe other places might be like, okay, the people there might be empowered and, and drive for change. Um, on that note, he moves to say, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. What I, what I basically said this mean was that um, the ones in charge, they will never move or put themselves in a position to lose what they have or being thrown over to, um, by the people who they are in charge of. So basically the rich is not gonna make decisions that gonna, that's gonna cause them to be, become poor. It's the people who are below them who are the oppressed have to move and obviously try to apply pressure to the oppressors in that sense that, because they have a saying that says, pressure causes a pipe to break. So in this sense, I would say the pipe is what the rich have and the oppressed are the ones who can apply the pressure to break the pipe. So <clears throat> with that being said, I'm basically just saying what he's saying is that people need to move. Like we can't sit any longer, as you were saying earlier, if we sit any longer, it would be almost saying that, okay, we're okay with it and there's not a problem. And he's basically saying, we have to move for ourselves. And with the whole background of they, um, them talking about God and all that type of stuff, the Bible says, um, the Lord, God helps those who help themselves. So if he sees that there is a, effort made that's where he would probably step in and be like okay i can pave a way for these people to feel better because they are trying to help themselves because god is not gonna just hand you something when you're just sitting over there all lazy and be like oh i hope god does this for me we have to do it 
we have to apply pressure to the oppressors to allow the rich to stop getting richer and the poor stop um, being poor. Um, another point I have here, it says, there comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. Um, this is where, in the letter he quotes St. Augustine saying that, an, um, no, that's another point. I lost track for a second, my bad. Um, yes, where I said the oppressed cannot, can, the oppression can last for so long and no more is what he's basically saying when he says there comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to, plun to be plunged in the abyss of despair. This is where he's saying, okay, he's basically speaking for himself, I would say, because he's trying to make a move to say, okay, this has went on for so much time. I have had enough. And he's gonna see if he can motivate the people around him to move with him, to move against the oppressors, because he's saying, okay, enough is enough. We've been through this for how many years for us to even get our right to vote or, or constitutional right. And then again, in the letter, he quotes St. Augustine saying that an unjust law is no law at all. Um, he says, we as a people have the responsibility to obey laws, which is right. We hear it all the time that people should fall in line and obey. But something that we don't normally hear that he said is that we also have the responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And then what got me thinking there was that who draws the line to say what is just and what is unjust? Because we all have um, different discretions of what we think is right and what is wrong. That is why we have people who are racists. And that is why we have people who are not racists. And that is why we even have people who are good and people who are evil or bad in a sense, because everyone uses their discretion differently. But he gives us, further on, he gives us his guideline on what he feels a just law is and what an unjust law he um, is. He said his example of a just law is a man-made code that falls in line with moral law and the law of God, while an unjust law is a code which is not in line with moral law. So there, he's not, give, he's not just leaving us out in the cold to say, okay, you go and decide what is just and what is unjust. He gives us a path to say, okay, this is what I feel is just, and this is what I feel is unjust. And then it's up to your discretion to say, okay, this guy makes sense, or this guy does not make sense. And the last point that I had was, I saw throughout the reading that he has high regard for St. Thomas and St. Augustine in the letter because he uses um, quotes from them to get his different points across. Um, the quote he made from St. Thomas Aquinas um, was when he was speaking about unjust law. And it says that an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. So as you were saying, he's well-rounded. He knows what's going on because he takes from different individuals to bring his point together to show that, okay, going back to what um, I think it was St. Thomas did or St. Augustine did, where he took from the left, took from the right, and he made a middle ground. St. Thomas. Yes, that's well, what St. Aristotle, Aristotle too. Yes, so I think he's doing the same thing as well, where he's taking from St. Thomas and taking from St. Augustine to basically use his, to, to show that his information is valid and you can rely on it. He's pulling from reliable sources, which in this form comes as St. Thomas and St. Augustine. So that's pretty much what I had to say, even though it was a lot of rambling and going back no, and no, forth. No, no, that's good. Um, <laughs> so Alicia, did you want to respond? Yeah, just real quick, because I know he's going to have to go. Um, the, about the just versus unjust. Um, in one of Dr. Peck, Dr. Peck, one of Dr. Beck's papers that I was reading for 
uh, the women's issues class, she wrote, um, at least I'm crediting you, I don't think you were quoting somebody else. If, if a society wanted to claim to be just, then it had to treat every member justly. Um, so every member had to be treated in, in the same manner. They had to have the same privileges and rights and value really as every other member. And if they didn't, they, they weren't a just society. Opportunities, so, and, given opportunities, right? Right, right. And, and what you said about uh, injustice anywhere threatens justice everywhere. Um, I actually took some notes on that also, but I didn't apply it so strictly to the one issue uh, to me, which I thought was interesting, like you did. I, to me, I took it in a bigger context saying, if we allow this injustice to stand, what, you know, what won't we allow? That's kind of where my mind went with it. It's going to threaten our system of justice for other issues as well. So. Great. Okay, good. Um, okay, Warren, let me just, I could, we could start the class tomorrow with my responses, but Mostly it's African-Americans are not by nature inferior, right? That was a lie. And so our society was based on a lie. And so the truth is they have equal capacity and they should be given equal opportunity, right? In a, they have equal ability, so a just society would give them equal opportunity and it right. does not, right? And people are not gonna give up their privilege. They have unjust privilege. And they won't give it up unless somebody makes eats it out. But some white people had to give it up. I mean, how can you read the Bible? How can you read the Bible and call yourself Christian and sit there and oppress someone based on a lie, right? I mean, that's what really annoys them. <laughs> you can just call yourself evil. Fine, you know. But don't call yourself Christian. That's so annoying. Um, all right. Well, we'll talk. I'll talk about it a little bit more on Thursday. But so I'll see you Thursday at eight thirty. Is that right? Yeah. Is that okay with you guys? Thanks. I mean, I love talking to you, and um, I mean, I hope you guys like it. It's it, it's so important to get this tradition in the back of your head, I think, right? Because it all keeps coming back, right? So, so we've had this terrible tension between police officers and black men, right? Getting shot. And so finally they decided they're not gonna put up with it, right? My God, it's very similar thing. I mean, not, you know, there's some progress, but there's, also backlash and okay okay we'll see you um so alicia alicia yeah. and i are going to meet for another class warren so you can go to your you have a class at one or you have a study or something yeah yes okay we'll see you All later bye-bye we'll bye. um alicia would you like to take a break do you have to go to the bathroom and get something, a drink? No, I uh, I had to stop there for a second and take some medicine. I was getting a headache. Uh, but I want to try and I want to try and push through. So because I we don't want to get too far behind. The doctor is calling me in a medicine that's supposed to help prevent migraines as opposed to get rid of them once you get them. Oh, so I'm, yeah. I'm excited for that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, well, let's see. Um, so we talked about the paper, you know, uh -huh. on capabilities. So now this is a whole bunch of short, short excerpts. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so I'm going to start with this model of John Locke and Adam Smith. So um, 
I'm not sure we're doing this in the philosophical psychology class. We probably should. But it's just a model of rights. We use rights language all the time, right? And it's it started, well, the British had what was called divine right of kings. Uh, wait a second. I got to stop recording this. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know if you want me Do to you record. want to exit out and just start a new room? Do you want, 